When law and morality contradict each other, the citizen has the cruel alternative of either losing his moral sense or losing his respect for the law. That was boss yet. Hey everyone, Stephen Clyde here with another episode you're not going to want to miss. As you all know, police brutality has been a more than common theme in the news in the past few years, and it seems like almost every day there's another incident with regard to abuse of power. Uh, sometimes the things we hear are downright awful. Of course, there was a uh, the Eric Garner case in 2004 where he was killed after being put in a chokehold for selling untaxed cigarettes. So if you think the government won't kill you over taxes, you're wrong. And all, you all are probably aware of the many examples I could provide. So I did an episode recently on guns and gun control, which is episode five and in which I'll link to. But today we're going to talk to a former police officer. His name is Mike Tilden. And if you all remember in episode two, that was with Daniel Elwood, we talked about the Libertarian Union. And, uh, you know, this is a group of podcasters and we all support each other. So check us out. Um, now, Mike is a self-described rep recovering Republican. He hosts uh, Battle for Liberty, which is uh, a podcast dedicated to the journey of the libertarian novice. And you can find him at battleforliberty.com. Thank you so much for finally coming on, Mike. Yeah, not a problem. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. We had some technical difficulties last time, but I think uh, this is, sounds a lot smoother. And uh, yeah, man. So uh, when did you first become a cop? Yeah, so um, I went to school. Um, before I went to college, I was a EMT and a firefighter, and uh, I felt very strongly about public service. I felt very strongly about helping people. And um, at that time in my life, I was convinced that the next logical step in my journey to help people when they need it the most was to become a police officer. And so I majored in criminal justice at Penn State University. And uh, then immediately in my senior year began applying for police jobs all over the country. And uh, I didn't know it, but uh, you know, my, my best chance and my first job as a police officer came right there in my college town in State College, Pennsylvania, working for uh, the university where I went to school. I mean, what did you feel your role was going to be when you became a police officer? Because um, did you think you were going to be helping people in need or did you want to enforce laws that were left on force? Uh, what was your mindset at the time, if you can remember? Well, I could definitely remember. It's, it's clear as day to me that uh, when, you, when you're young and, uh, you know, I was 21, 22 years old. Yeah, 22 years old. When you're that young, you really haven't, at least I, I should say most people, haven't really researched and found a philosophy for life that they want to carry with them for the rest of their lives. And so they're left to uh, simply uh, take in what they learn from others rather than doing the, doing the homework of their own rational thought and their own reasoning and their own discernment. And so I picked up what everyone else is putting down to, to coin a recent phrase. And, and what I mean by that is, everyone said that if you want to help people, you need to work for the government. Specifically, you need to be, um, you know, a paramedic or you need to be uh, a firefighter or you need to be a police officer or you need to be in the military. I was very close to joining the military. That was something I thought about for a long time and came to uh, the conclusion that for me, the military was not right, but but law enforcement was, was my way of life. And so when I joined, uh, first by going to the academy and then by becoming a full-time employed police officer, my mindset was that I was going to be helping people every day. I, I believed uh, what they taught me in the academy and I believed what I learned from popular culture, which is that police officers risk their lives every single day uh, and are completely selfless and everything that they do serves the, the common good. So that was my mindset going in. I mean, I didn't even have this question written down, but maybe you could tell us what were some of the things they were telling you in the academy? Well, to be fair, you know what? I'll start with the things they told us that were absolutely true uh, because there's a lot that they tell you in the academy that's not true. But I do want to be fair. And, and it, it's very clear in my mind that one of the things they taught us that I did not internalize as I should is that your life changes completely when you become a police officer. They teach you that... Uh, through the experience of other officers who are teaching the class, um, they teach you that uh, one thing that stands out in my mind, which is just amazing to me is they said, if you have a girlfriend or someone in your life now, 
who doesn't know you as a police officer, chances are that person is not going to stay with you very long. And I didn't quite understand what they meant at the time. I was dating a girl and I was very serious about this girl. Um, and I didn't know up from down, left from right. I was young and in retrospect, I feel like I was very uneducated. She was a wonderful girl, very nice girl, but I didn't have a future with her. But at the time I thought I did. And sure enough, they were right. Sure enough, they were 100% right. Um, you know, that relationship didn't last. It didn't work out. And ultimately what they were getting at is that becoming a police officer changes you as a person. And it's one of the reasons I'm not a police officer today. That job, that lifestyle, that mentality was taking its toll on me. And we can talk about that uh, just in a little bit. But but I will say I'm, I'm very open with anyone who asks me that I'm not a police officer today for many reasons. One of which is, you know, I was on my way to becoming a libertarian and that didn't square with working for the state. But but more than that, and and I think a little bit deeper than that, I was becoming a person I didn't like. And they warned us about that in the police academy. So that that's the first thing is that they they told us we would be different people once we became police officers. And that is absolutely true. You do become a different person. But now how about the things that they uh, tell you that just aren't true? So one of the things they tell you is that um, in every single encounter that you have with the public, someone wants to kill you. I'm not kidding. I, I had multiple instructors tell me that, that in every single encounter that you have with the public, there's a chance that the person you're dealing with wants to kill you. And okay, that may be true, but that's also true of the general public. I mean, I can walk around all day long in any city in the country or in the world, and it's absolutely possible that someone wants to kill me, right? That's possible. What they don't talk about is whether it's probable, right? They don't, they don't teach you about the statistics. They don't teach you about how common it is for the people that you encounter to not only um, possess a weapon and the knowledge to use it, but then to actually try to use it. I, to this day, don't know what that statistic is. I doubt it's very high. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's very, very low. But that doesn't stop them from showing you videos and pictures and giving you case studies day after day after day for months and months, inculcating you with the idea that everyone you meet is not only a criminal, but wishes to kill you. And so... Uh, the brainwashing starts at a very early stage in the police academy where you are convinced that everyone in the public has the capability to kill you. And again, that that's possible. It's just not probable. Uh, so that that's that's one example. I mean, looking back now, and I'm sure this is what people really, really want to hear. What were some of the most unjust uses of power you witnessed? And, and in fact, do you have any stories in particular for this question? Because it'd be no problem to take longer than necessary to go into detail about some of these issues because people want to hear, like, what did you actually see? Like, you were the person behind the mask, so to speak. Yeah, um, I, I definitely have some examples that I can tell you about. Before I tell you about specific examples, though, I think it's really important to make the distinction between the sensationalized uses of force that we hear about in the media. Um, and when I, when I say the media, sometimes it's the mass media. That's true. Sometimes we do hear about police brutality and police uh, over uh, misuse of power in the mass media. But other times it's uh, alternative media. And even in the alternative media, sometimes uh, police abuse of power and police brutality is sensationalized because the example that they're using is in itself sensational. But those are important to know. Those are important to remember. And they serve as a as a really, really uh, vital example. But for me personally, the thing that I like to get across to people is, okay, even if those sensational examples aren't the norm, and I, honestly, I can't tell you if they're the norm or if they're an outlier. I don't think they're an outlier. But just in case I'm not educated enough to tell you, what I can tell you is that it's the tiny, small abuses of power that happen every single day that seem minute and they seem unimportant, but what they do is, is they serve to teach the public and law enforcement officers themselves that what they're doing is okay and that their overreach is acceptable and that it's tolerated. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I can remember specifically one instance where I was uh, directing traffic after a, a major event and uh, as these major events let out, it's very difficult to regulate traffic in the way that you would normally regulate traffic. And so they assign officers to 
manually run a traffic light. So rather than letting a traffic light operate on its timer or weight sensor or wh whatever it is that it operates on, they put a human being with a button uh, sitting next to a traffic light. And I'm sure at large sporting events, you've, you've seen this before. This is very common. And I was assigned to this one night. Well, uh, I may or may not have been doing a good job. I have no idea, but, uh, a citizen decided he was going to inform me of what a terrible job I was doing in terms of timing the lights, the green lights and the red lights properly. And in retrospect, it's funny because I mean, really, whose life did it affect? Who was really being harmed by this? Nobody's. But at the time, because I was a police officer and because I had that power, I took it upon myself to enact vengeance on this man simply for voicing his displeasure. Now, granted, he did it with a four-letter word and he was very mean and he was very uh, ill-spirited. But nonetheless, I, being a human being with some power over him, took it upon myself to take the little clicker that I had in my hand. It's a little thumb button that I just put back on the, on the traffic pole, walked over to his car and said, Oh, sir, you, you seem to have uh, a complaint. Would you like to lodge a complaint? And of course I'm going into a sarcastic, ridiculous routine with this man purposefully to keep him at the red light longer than he had to be. And so you can see in this tiny little insignificant example that I was enacting vengeance upon this guy. He was telling me that he didn't like the way I was doing things and I knew I had power over him. And so I used that power to uh, keep him at that red light longer really than he should have been. Uh, and that's, to me, that's more, it seems like a stupid, insignificant example. If anyone's listening to this, they're going, Mike, that's really dumb. I, I, why are you using that as an example? And the reason I'm using it is because it highlights the fact that Although there are sensational examples of police using physical violence uh, excessively to the point that people die innocently, that does happen. Absolutely. It happens way more than it ever should. But the thing I think that is more pernicious is the thing that goes unnoticed and goes um, undiscussed. And, and no one seems to care when police abuse their power in that small fashion. And from my personal experience, that serves to confirm in the attitude of a police officer that this is okay. And of course there are uh, exceptions to that rule. In fact, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that I worked with several officers who, uh, despite the state system and despite their inculcation as law enforcement officers, I think truly deep down they were doing everything they could to do good in the world, but they had chosen a method to do it that really doesn't make it possible. So that's one example. Um, other examples do include physical violence. I can remember using violence upon people who had committed no uh, morally criminal act. Maybe they had violated the law. Sure. Lots of drug abuse, lots of drug use, lots of controlled substance abuse, lots of underage drinking, lots of things that did not harm any person. Uh, but yet we still, as law enforcement officers, because the law said that you cannot drink before the age of 21 and that you cannot possess a small amount of marijuana and that, you know, you cannot do this or that. You cannot sit on the street corner and ask for money. You cannot uh, sell t-shirts without a business license. All of these things, we were ready and willing to use physical violence to stop these things from happening. And, and at the end of the day, after leaving law enforcement and reflecting on my life and reflecting on uh, what I had done and asking myself, was I really doing any good? I have to say the majority of the time I wasn't. Um, and so uh, I'll leave it there and, and let you uh, ask another question so I don't ramble on for another 20 minutes. Now, I remember when I was in high school, I was in a McDonald's once and there was a guy there. I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, he was this older guy and he, he had like a Civil War style mustache, but he had a t-shirt that says, that that said, cops say legalize drugs. Ask me why. And I sure did. And he told me the truth, essentially. But tell me about law enforcement against prohibition and your participation in it. Yeah. So law enforcement against uh, prohibition um, is an organization that's actually recently changed their name. Um, it's the uh, law enforcement action. I'm getting it wrong. This is horrible. I just joined. Let me look it up. This This will be good. No, that's good. Go ahead. The Law Enforcement Action Partnership. And so it's actually really important that they change their name because when when LEAP, L-E-A-P, LEAP, first started, it was Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. 
which is the root of their mission. But they learned as they grew and they gained members who were former law enforcement officers, current law enforcement officers, former judges, former uh, state prosecutors, anyone in the law enforcement industry uh, who, who came into the organization, they gradually learned that there's really more law enforcement reform that's necessary outside of strictly repealing drug prohibition. And so they, they changed their name and their mission to Law Enforcement Action Partnership. But still a very large portion of what they do is uh, speaking out not only to state officials, elected officials, uh, and other law enforcement personnel, but just the general public about the evils of drug prohibition. And so that gentleman with that t-shirt, uh, what he was really doing is he's trying to spread the word that there are so many police officers out there who have functioned in the law enforcement industry and have seen the futility of uh, the prohibition of controlled substances to the point that it's become painfully aware to to me and to many of my uh, former brothers and sisters and and people of that nature that not only does the drug prohibition do nobody any good, but in fact inflicts far more harm upon countless innocent people, people with addictions, people who are struggling, people who uh, really need to be treated as if they have a medical problem or a psychological problem. It treats them as criminals and throws them in cages and puts them in situations where the only thing they can do to cope is to dive further into drug addiction and drug dependence. It's really sad. Uh, and I feel a lot of people, the reason that there's a whole group of law enforcement officials who have started this organization is because they've seen it on the front lines themselves and they don't buy the propaganda anymore. They don't buy the notion that, uh, that strictly prohibiting an item or a substance or anything else makes it less available. It doesn't, you know, it, it, I don't know the exact statistic, but anecdotally we hear all the time that, uh, you, you, prisons in the United States are the highest controlled areas in the entire country. And yet drugs still find their way in. It's like higher than North Korea. It's like really, really eerie statistics. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, it, and it mostly affects, uh, minorities. I'm sure, I'm sure you saw that firsthand, like, um, you know, there's like Black Lives Matter, but it should be, you know, they should, they should be talking about the bigger picture because obviously like when there's like a killing by a police officer, it's always, oh, he's racist. Well, why, why aren't you going against state? Why aren't you talking about state power as a whole? Um, yeah, I, I, that's something that, uh, bothers me to my core is that, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, as, as much as I disagree with their messaging and their, uh, their methods, there really is some logic behind what they're feeling, at least, um, and, and that's probably a contradiction. There's, I would say, some understanding behind their behind their emotions. That's a better way to say it. Um, at least I have some understanding behind their emotions. Certainly not the kind of understanding that I would get if I had grown up um, as a minority in a, in a town that's effectively occupied by a, a militaristic police force. Uh, but what I'm trying to get at here is that. The Black Lives Matter movement really should be focusing on drug prohibition, um, the right to own your body, to own yourself, to put substances in your body as you see fit, and the right to defend yourself, the right to own and possess a firearm legally and to defend yourself. Uh, when you look at the areas uh, where black lives are lost the most, it's typically in areas where drug prohibition enforcement is at its highest and gun regulation is at its highest. Uh, and so what this means is that the only way uh, to defend yourself, and many times uh, with a very low education and uh, a high minimum wage that you can't meet with your skill set, the, the only way to get along in life is to become a gang member, to become a criminal, to uh, break the laws that are in some odd way supposedly meant to protect you, uh, it's a system that's stacked against them. And, and as I said before, there's, there's a militaristic police force that lives in their community that does not represent them and does not speak for them. And so I have to say that at least from an emotional level, I can at least understand why they might feel the way they feel. Although I, I do wholeheartedly disagree with a lot of their messaging. Uh, yeah, um, I know. I, I agree that they should be mad. It's uh, it, the only problem is it's who they direct the anger yeah. at. It, it, you know, they directed at the same, they directed at the wrong people and they support 
they support bigger government essentially yeah. which is going to be the people that you know put them behind bars yeah but, well uh, it's a it's a commonality they they share with i would say a lot of groups of people who at the end of the day whatever they're mad about they they want to go to government they want to go to the state to fix right. this problem and and because of a lack of education they don't realize it's precisely that institution which uh which is causing the problem yeah, it's definitely a good point. Well, I one question I've been really, really excited to ask you, and let me frame it this way. Um, one thing you hear a lot of socialists say is the state is only there to protect private property. And it is true I can call the police if my business is robbed or if my house is broken into. But in general, when, say, for example, I'm driving along and I notice a police car behind me, I don't think to myself, wow, my, my private property is more protected. I, I, I think to myself, like, wow, like I... I got to drive like really, really carefully. Like if this guy pulls me over, you have like kind of like a gut feeling that it's going to turn in the way more than speeding if it's even going to be that. And you just have like this weird. So I, I personally don't feel like the state protects my private property. How, how do you feel about that situation? <laughs> yeah, it's not common. Um, in terms of protecting private property, you can, you know, you can think of property crimes like burglary, theft, uh, arson, that kind of thing. Um, and with the exception of arson, because I would say arson, um, there's a probably a moderately better degree of success in terms of investigating and prosecuting arson. But in terms of burglary and theft, man, what a what an abysmal clearance rate for police officers. They really don't do an effective job of uh, that kind of police work. And to get at your larger point in terms of, okay, if they're not good at protecting your property, which I would argue they're they're not good at protecting your property, what is it they're good at? Why are we all afraid of the police officer driving behind us? Well, I have a great story to tell you. Uh, when I was a brand new police officer, maybe a year into the job, um, I, uh, I can't even remember what the traffic infraction was, but I had pulled someone over and given them a ticket for something. God only knows what. Uh, and uh, the guy had the audacity to take me to court and to fight it. Oh, how dare he? So we went to court and I gave my case to the judge and he gave his case to the judge. And one of my key factors was that uh, my whole reason for pulling him over was that I noticed that he appeared to be driving in a nervous manner, whatever that means. But that's what I testified to. And uh, the judge who, funny enough, quick aside, at the time, this judge was the judge in our jurisdiction that no police officer wanted to come in front of. Um, and the reason is because he tended to side with the citizens more than he sided with the police officers. And none of us could understand this because he used to be a police officer in our jurisdiction. And yet he sided with the citizens more than he sided with the police officers. And we couldn't understand it. We thought he was a traitor. We thought he had lost his sense of brotherhood and, and all this sort of stuff. Uh, only years later, upon reflection, would I realize that he had some libertarian leanings inside of him. Uh, and so at this particular small claims trial, it wasn't a trial. I'm using that word to make it something that everyone can understand. But at this small claims trial, I gave my side of the story and the defendant gave his side of the story. And the, uh, the judge, uh, before he said anything, he looked me right in the eyes. And I think I didn't appreciate it at the time. I was I was actually pretty upset and I was ignorant and, and egotistical and, and just didn't understand what he was trying to teach me. But he looked me right in the eyes and he said, officer, you need to understand I'm a judge in this jurisdiction. And even I get so nervous when there's a police officer driving behind me that I tend to drive erratically. And so that in and of itself really is not reason enough to pull someone over and to give them a citation. And so he dismissed the case. No fine, not guilty, nothing. And I was livid. I was so mad. I was madder than a hornet. And, uh, you know, like I said, it took me years to reflect on that. Only after I had gone through my conversion from a, a pretty big statist to as libertarian as it comes as an anarchist, only then did I look back on that example and think, man, this was not about saving lives. This was not about protecting property to get back to your question. This was about enforcing the law. That's a really, I, really great story. And uh, who, who was that judge? You should write that judge a letter. Just be like, hey, like you're years later, like you, you kind of pissed me off, but like you were right. And, uh, you know, I think most judges are probably more strict in that sense. 
I mean, I, I've, I've been to court a few times, not for anything serious, but just random times. And, uh, you know, the judges seem pretty strict from what I've seen. I'd be pretty interested to know who that judge was. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'll tell you offline. I, I don't feel yeah. like seeing... I know him absolutely. I have his name in my head right now. I, and I don't feel like saying it on a podcast episode because it's not my story to tell from that angle. Uh, but uh, I would like I would like to see if you could contact him and just hey ask like hey are you a libertarian by the way is that why you said what you said to me <laughs> that's a really good you know I never thought about contacting him maybe I will but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that yeah. offline but just related to this I I do want to just take a moment to to go over something that uh, I've talked about on my podcast before um, and I don't think I've focused on it as I should have. But it gets into this last question you asked about property, the protection of property rights versus law enforcement. And there's a history here that people need to understand. And I would be uh, derelict in my duty as a libertarian if I didn't draw your listeners to this point. And that is the, the history of police officers worldwide, but especially in America, um, years and years and years ago, the, the police officer was originally known as a peace officer. And the reason they were known as a peace officer is because their job was to keep the peace. And it was almost universally understood that keeping the peace meant protecting property, protecting lives and protecting property, your life being your most precious property, but other property as well. Their job was to make sure that you were safe and your property was safe. And if there were infractions against those things, they would step in and they would stop the infraction and they might have to do something to... Uh, administer justice in terms of um, uh, some sort of, uh, not reparation, but uh, I'm blanking on a word. Restitution? Restitution. Thank you. There you go. They would need to, uh, to administer some sort of restitution, whether it was making you whole again uh, by paying for your, your medical bills or paying for your property that was lost. Uh, restitution was a big part of it. Slowly over time, though, as the laws became more numerous and more numerous, and the peace officers became responsible as the state grew, peace officers became more and more responsible for laws that didn't have much to do with protecting property and protecting life. And so they became known as police officers because it really wasn't appropriate to call them peace officers anymore. They didn't just keep the peace. They were also police. And as that changed, it became more and more militarized, and the laws became more numerous and more numerous than we could ever have imagined. The term morphed once again from police officer to law enforcement officer. And so we finally arrive today in, in, in the society in which our police officers, our peace officers, our law enforcement officers, and their job is to enforce the law. Their job is not to use discretion, their job is not to make quick judgments based on who they know and, uh, you know, in a small community. These are large behemoth mammoth police off, uh, police departments who can't possibly know the people that they police. And so their job has become one that lacks discretion and lacks judgment and is focused solely on enforcing the law. And so the question was, why do you feel so nervous when a police officer drives behind you? Because you, from the day you were born, have known instinctively that the police officer is not there to protect you. Sure, they might protect you here and there, but the Supreme Court has ruled many times they have no duty to protect you. If they fail to protect you and you die, nothing bad happens to them. That's not their job. Their job is to enforce the law, regardless of whether or not that law is just. And that's something they don't teach in the police academy is to make a judgment on whether or not the law is just. They teach you that your job is to enforce it. Right. And that right. to me is something I couldn't square. And it's one of the reasons that I, I'm not in that occupation anymore. I hear you. I mean, you often hear from people who have, let's say like an uncle or family member who is a cop. They'll claim that in their experience, cops are good people, but is there such thing as a good cop? And obviously, obviously you're a good guy, you're next cop, but I mean, you, I, I'm sure you understand what I'm asking a lot. Or, yeah. or when you sign up to be a cop, do you know you're going to, do you know you're going to enforce things that are sometimes unjust? I mean, did you even have that in your mind? Like, huh? Like, no, I'm probably going to do some good things, but I'm probably going to enforce a lot of things that are unjust. Like, no, I think, I, I think, yeah, like you're not, you're nodding your head. I don't think a lot of people would have had that in their head. No, and I've, to be fair, I've covered the, the uh, there's an essay out there, I can't remember the author's name, but there's an essay out there called The Myth of the Good Cop. 
And I've covered that on my podcast. I, I, have, I don't run away from that. Um, so we'll start from that angle first. Uh, the idea of the myth of the good cop is that, uh, and, and the author who writes this, his argument is that there's no such thing as a good cop. Even the cops we know who are, who in, in other areas of their life are moral, upstanding gentlemen and gentlewomen, and they want to help, and they may even be very religious and focused on altruism and things other than themselves, very selfless people. Even if those people exist, the author claims, because they do a job that is focused purely on um, obedience through the use of violence, and enforcing laws that are themselves unjust, and enforcing uh, tax laws, which are nothing but theft, and, and things like that, that they either don't know it and are painfully ignorant to the point that they're negligent, or they know it and they don't care. So no matter what, there's no such thing as a good cop. That's how the argument goes. And I'm sympathetic to that argument, but I don't quite prescribe to it 100%. Here's why. Now, you could say that I'm uh, colored by my experience and colored by my personal relationships, but I will tell you, I know many police officers still to this day who, through no fault of their own, believe that they are doing good and believe they have, they have drink, they've taken in and absorbed everything that was fed to them in terms of their job, in terms of their role in society, and in terms of the way society is, and they haven't taken the time to really investigate. And before I stop and agree with the author of The Myth of the Good Cop and say, well, that necessarily means that they are either ignorant or willfully evil, I, I can't go that far because uh, I'm a forgiving person and I myself was in that position years ago and I believed everything that was fed to me. And I don't know what it was, if it was luck uh, but I certainly am not arrogant enough to think that I'm just smarter and I'm just better than those people. I think that would be really arrogant uh, to think that. I do believe there are very good people out there who are trying to do the job as a law enforcement officer. And I even remember their frustration as we sat together and we talked about how useless it seemed sometimes and how we just got burned out and what that frustration is. That's the personification of them not understanding why what they're doing isn't having any positive effect. They haven't taken the final step. They're not there yet. And gosh, I'd love to take them that final leap. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, someone like me who converts to an anti-law enforcement and an anti-police state mentality, sometimes that's very personally painful to them and they don't want to be my friend anymore and they don't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> um, and it, it's true. It, it, it's really sad and it's really a shame, but there, there are definitely people out there who um, their entire personality and their entire persona is consumed by being a law enforcement officer. And because I speak against it and because I have a different experience and because I would have the audacity to say, I challenge you to justify what you're doing from a personal and natural rights perspective, because I say that, they will interpret it as a personal attack against them because their identity has become police officer. Right. It's very personal and it's very sad, but this was a very long-winded rambling way to answer. I do believe there are good people out there who are trying to be police officers. I simply believe that they're not educated and they have not accepted the fact that what they learned and what they are living is not true. I think even Robert Higgs would find that reasonable. <laughs> well, I guess cut, just cut to kind of to wrap up here, I'm going to ask you one more question. Uh, considering I'll take any opportunity to talk Rothbard. Um, you said your for, uh, first introduction to libertarianism was for New Liberty. Please tell us about that. I have the book right behind me. Yeah, what a wonderful book. Um, you know, my, my conversion to libertarianism story is not sexy or exciting. There's One thing we love to do as libertarians is talk about our conversion stories. And... I'm no exception to that. I gosh, I love telling this story, but mine is uh, tragically uh, anticlimactic because my conversion story starts with me being a big R Republican statist um, and being a huge talk radio listener. Rush Limbaugh and Mark Levin um, and Andrew Wilkow on Sirius XM, um, just big R Republicanism all day and night, especially at night. I, I had a Sirius XM satellite radio that I brought with me in my patrol car. I would work midnights and I would just listen nonstop as I drove around. 
And luckily, I, I, I talk about this in episode one of my podcast. Luckily, that turned into listening to a gentleman by the name of Mike Church, who is no longer with SiriusXM, but he was a talk radio personality on SiriusXM for many years. And he was uh, a Republican for a long time, and he's no libertarian today. But it doesn't matter because he opened my eyes to the idea that it started with militarism, that the military was not all that I had learned that it was. I was a huge military supporter. And from him, he brought Tom Woods, a gentleman named Tom Woods, who I'd never heard of. He brought him on his radio program to talk about constitutionalism because I considered myself a constitutional conservative. I was loyal to the Constitution until the day I died, but still supported the Iraq War. What? Anyways, he brought Tom Woods on, and Tom Woods made a lot of sense, and boy, did he use logic and reasoning and things that I had just, areas of my mind I hadn't exercised in years. And from Tom Woods, I started listening to his podcast, and from Tom Woods, he introduced me to Murray Rothbard. And I hadn't heard that term, excuse me, that name. Uh, before. I said, who's this Murray Rothbard? There's a lot of libertarians who don't know who Murray Rothbard is. Let's just be honest. That's absolutely I mean, true. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call them libertarians, not necessarily, but... Well, they think so, they are. So, yeah, they think they're libertarians. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the the grand Mac daddy of them all, the father of modern libertarianism, as I would argue, uh, good good old Murray Rothbard, who unfortunately I never had the, the good grace to meet. Uh, but Tom Woods in, in, uh, introduced me to Murray Rothbard, and I did not understand what the Mises Institute was or who Ludwig von Mises was or anything like this. I was, you know, I was a, a baby in the libertarian movement, but I was introduced. And uh, at the urging of uh, Mr. Tom Woods, I went to Mises.org and I looked up Murray Rothbard and I found, my gosh, there's dozens of books available for free at the Mises Institute. Oh, and, just uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. And yeah, I, I don't, I don't know I'm how they sure can, you're right. Hundreds. I, I said dozens, but I'm sure it's hundreds. Yeah, I don't know how they can afford to do that, but good. <laughs> yeah, but through the magic of um, technology, which, by the way, evil capitalism gave us, through the magic of technology, I was introduced to this book for a new liberty. Um, and to be honest, the first Murray Rothbard book I read was Anatomy of the State. And while I appreciated everything that was in Anatomy of the State, for some reason, I was not slapped in the face with libertarianism until I graduated from anatomy of the state to for a new liberty. And the reason I think is that with anatomy of the state, you can read that small short book and still try to cling to the notions of statism that you once had. You can try. But as my brother put it, um, after I encouraged him to read for a new liberty, when Murray Rothbard gets done with you at the end of for a new liberty, you feel as though there's just no argument you can make. There's just nothing you can bring forward that he hasn't anticipated, that he hasn't argued, and that he hasn't absolutely squashed in terms of statism. Absolutely. And that's how I felt after I read For New Liberty. And so although while I was a disciple of Mike Church and Tom Woods for probably two or three years, I still considered myself a minarchist. I still considered there was room in this world for uh, an organization that uses violence to, to force cooperation. I'm sure you didn't even frame it that way. I don't think I don't, no. think, I don't think minarchists frame it like, oh, I think we just need a little tiny bit of violence. No, they don't, they don't admit that they're violent at all. Right. They think, they think that it's uh, consens consensual because the majority voted or whatever. So. Social contract. Or it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's the last vestige of statism. And, and to be fair, I don't expect most people I'll meet in my life will ever graduate to anarchism. It's just not common. It's not, I don't think it's in our lifetime. I hate to be negative folks. Um, my personal opinion, I don't think it's in our lifetime, but I do think what's in our lifetime are the efforts of people like Stephen Clyde and the Peace and Liberty podcast um, and many others, Tom Woods and Lou Rockwell and uh, Dave Smith and just tons of others that I haven't named that are wholly worthwhile of spending your time to get to know them because what they will do is they will point you to the giants. Uh, some of them are giants, some of us not quite yet, if ever, but they will point you to the giants uh, like Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, um, they will point you to the people who will show you that there really is no sense in statism. Um, and so I think I'll probably leave it there. Hey, it's been great having you on, Mike. You have a lot of great stories and probably won't be the last time I'll have you on. So I, uh, it's 
uh, you're a good friend and everyone check out battleforliberty.com his podcast is great he's part of the libertarian union so we'll see you next time mike thanks for coming on it's been my pleasure i can't wait to come back on and here's hoping next time we'll be uh, doing it live uh in studio together so uh can't wait for that that sounds good man all right guys we'll see you tomorrow Hey everyone, please like, follow, donate, subscribe, and share. Any donations will be used to reach more people.